sir. Okay, we're sort of in the uh, phase of the course where we're actually beginning the process of starting to wrap things up. Our last lecture, our, our full lecture that you'll be responsible for, is actually only three weeks out. And we have a lot of material to get through, and I want to uh, really encourage you to stay on top of things. In fact, I actually need uh, some help, and I need a volunteer or two to help me uh, write the final uh, sort of lecture study guides. So if you have a little bit of time this Friday, and can help me put out the study guides for the remainder of the course to get you ready for the final exam. If you can work on that together with me, uh, that'd be awesome. Just let me know by email uh, about your availability on Friday, because I'd like to get that st study package up for everyone over the weekend. So um, again, we're going back and looking at one of the things that we know the most about, which is about memory encoded within the brain. But surprisingly, we actually don't know many things uh, outside of what I'm going to be talking to you about today. In the course of the next few lectures, we're going to look at some of the controversies that exist within probably the best studied area of neuroscience, which is about um, long-term memory formation. So I haven't seen you in a while, so I just wanted to know how you were doing. So if you can go to um, this Poll Everywhere um, site, and you can just let me know how you're doing after your break. I hope you had a really good, relaxing break. I hope that you had the opportunity to uh, relax a little bit, do a little bit of studying, get ready for the final exam. And I just wanted to know, uh, as a class, how we are feeling right now. Okay, so wait for a few more responses. So I can tell you in advance that November is one of those times that's incredibly stressful for students. So it might um, actually be worthwhile coming in to chat with me if you have um, any issues that you're encountering over the next uh, week or so, if you're worried about the final exam and other things, um, let me help as much as I possibly can. Uh, I'm glad to see that there are students that are actually in this field here and that you're feeling pretty good. I know a lot of you are losing sleep. You're going to um, have that throughout most of November, to be quite honest. Uh, so try to take care of yourselves as much as you possibly can. 
So for the person who dropped this here, what does that mean? Like you're right on the borderline between feeling really good and maybe not feeling so great. Okay. All right, so uh, a couple of other things. I, I do want to start preparing you for the final exam. So maybe you can let me know, how can I help you prepare for the final exam? So again, same poll. You can let me know what you think might be useful for you. I'll try my very best to make sure that you're well prepared, not feeling quite as anxious uh, for the final exam. Or is there another option that I uh, haven't put up here that you can come up with? All of them. So why not all? Do you guys know what uh, a behavioral thing in, in, uh, in neuroscience uh, called thigmotaxis is? Thigmotaxis? You like being near borders? Like, that's a, a rodent behavior. Like, do you guys like lines and borders and walls? Like, okay, not sure why this class is doing that, but um, I'm probably going to use a combination of all of these different things uh, over the next few weeks to get you ready for the final exam. Uh, my goal is with someone or a couple of you in this class to get out a study guide that covers the entire remainder of the course so you can get ready at your own speed, as well as some practice questions that are embedded within it. Um, and some other uh, things that you'll be responsible for on discussion board for work. So all of those are going to be there for you. I will give you some hints and tips, and our last review session will actually have a lot of that uh, embedded directly within it to get you ready for the final exam. So all of these things will be uh, elements of how I'm going to try my best to get you ready. As I mentioned to you um, earlier, um, I also want... Oh, okay, so as I mentioned to you earlier, okay. you're going to have um, some questions that are, are going to be online. So there is an online quiz. This will be worth 1%. You're allowed to take it twice. I encourage you to chat with your colleagues or to use this to help you get ready for that online quiz. Some of those questions that you will be finding on that online quiz will also reappear in a very similar format on the final exam. And so I want to get you ready starting from today. And so we sort of left off with this circuit and this diagram of the hippocampus. This is the area that we think that memory starts to become in code. This is not the end of memory. This is the beginning of sensory memory. When you memorize something that you've seen on a paper or something that you've heard, all of that information is encoded through uh, this heterorhinal cortex. All the sensory input comes in. These individual axons come together to form what is known as the perforant pathway. That auditory information, the information about uh, the visual system, all of that comes together in this perforant pathway that then comes up into uh, an area um, of the dentate gyrus. So this circuit is one that you should make sure that you are well acquainted with for the final exam. And again, just to point out one more aspect that you'll need to know, and we're going to cover this in the next uh, question that immediately follows from this. Question one comes directly from this particular diagram that I ended with in the last lecture, which is related to this circuit here. If we were to take a look at this last circuit, so the CA3 sends one projection that we have talked about, uh, about previously, uh, known as the Schaffer collateral. But the other aspect that we don't really cover a lot of in neuroscience, the two hippocampi actually have to communicate with each other. And they will actually send a branch of their axon, which we call a commiseral axon or a commiseral fiber. So that one CA3 neuron here will send a chakra collateral axon, but that chakra collateral branches off, and this commiseral fiber actually goes to the opposite hippocampus. So the left hippocampus and the right hippocampus communicate with each other and send fibers to each other through these uh, CA3 neurons that we find within the hippocampus. And then, of course, the Schaffer collaterals that you see here are the ones that we are going to be spending the most time on because this is the most studied circuit within neuroscience over the last 25 years. Most individuals, at some point, if you're in neuroscience, and you're looking at the hippocampus, you will look at the chakra collaterals, their axons, and how they make synapses onto this group of neurons that we call the CA1. 
But again, I wanted you to be familiar with all of the different neurons that are found in this circuit, and in particular, the fact that these commiseral fibers are the ones that go from the left hippocampus to the right, and of course, the right hippocampus, the CA3 neurons, will also send a branch to the left hippocampus. Is that clear for everyone? We'll see if it's clear in a second, because this is actually one of the questions that is almost identical to what you will find on the online quiz um, that you will be taking later on today. So if you are looking at commiseral axons that connect the left and right hippocampi, which of the following hippocampal cells would Rick find that these axons most likely originated from? Okay, so um, most of you are picking none of the above. If you were to pick the cell that actually does have uh, commiseral fibers, which, which cell would it be? So it's not CA1, not CA2, CA3. So I, I think we all would all agree that if it came up that CA3 would be the best answer for having um, collateral axons. And that might be something that helps you for that online quiz that you take later on this evening. You, again, you have until Sunday evening to do it. You can do it twice. You can uh, collaborate with your colleagues. I really highly encourage you to do that. I have indicated on the lecture notes where that question came from, so you can always reference back to where that um, came from uh, in the lecture notes. Any questions on this before we go on? So CA3 would have been the best answer, but in this case, it's not available as an answer choice for you. So if you don't have any other questions, let, let's go back to this because it's actually a really um, interesting scenario. As far as we can tell, and um, as far as we know within the nervous system, it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. It turns out that most synapses that are chemical in nature, that have a neurotransmitter, therefore is a chemical uh, type of synapse, tend to be plastic. They can modify themselves. They can make the signal going across the synapse stronger, or the response going across the, the synapse stronger and or weaker. And we know that the strengthening of this communication occurs in an experience-dependent manner. You have to use the same synapses over and over again to make that synapse stronger. Just like using a muscle, and it's a very poor analogy, but it's one that's often used, if you keep using the same muscle set, that muscle group will be, become stronger over time. And in the same way, the communication between those synapses or groups of synapses will become strengthened as you continually use them in an experience or activity-dependent manner. So one of the things that this means is for the same strength of a presynaptic stimulus, so if I release exactly the same amount of neurotransmitter as I did before, and after I have used this pathway over and over again, if I've done so, that same amount of neurotransmitter now, that same amount of presynaptic stimulus, now will result in a much bigger response on the postsynaptic neuron. And that's really what LTP is. I release the same amount of glutamate as I've done before, but now, because I've been using this pathway over and over again for such a long period of time, that same amount of glutamate now produces a much bigger response in the postsynaptic uh, cell. And we call this strengthening or long-term potentiation. Analogous to this, we can also weaken synapses. And this mechanism isn't completely understood even in 2017. And this need to reset synapses is what we think LTD is. LTD, in my era, when we were studying LTP and we were studying LTD, used to be called a weakening of synapses. And maybe you've uh, heard that term. That is an incorrect term. It is not a weakening of a synapse. It is really a resetting of the synapse. We know that there are a finite number of synapses that we can actually manipulate. We can grow new ones, but those new ones don't seem to follow the same rules. So of all the ones that we have, we're continually resetting and stripping away information. That's LTD. And it's not necessarily a weakening in the traditional sense of what LTD, LTD used to be thought, thought of. And this is a general mechanism. As far as we can tell, if we try hard enough, most areas of the brain are actually capable of um, undergoing this type of plasticity, a modified response to the same type of stimuli. I, I uh, think that one of the things that you should always be uh, interested in is what, what sort of um, physiological phenomenon does this mean? Well, of course, we're going to talk about learning and memory. 
But let me talk to you about a slightly different aspect of what I think synaptic plasticity in theory um, could actually uh, mean. How many of you have heard of this term synesthesia? So you get two different senses that actually uh, kind of coalesce onto each other. So you might see music, in other words, or you might actually experience um, different types of things related to a particular sensation. So um, knowing that the brain is plastic, a few years ago, uh, I told you never to do self-experiments, but I tried this again just a few years ago. Um, I wanted to actually try to induce synesthesia in myself. Now, it sounds like a really bizarre um, experiment. So uh, I would have a number that was um, color-coded with a certain color, and I wanted to always associate the number one with the color red, and I always wanted to associate the number two with the color uh, green, etc., etc. So I had about four or five numbers. I thought very strongly that synaptic plasticity must exist. I must be able to create sort of the coalescence of um, having uh, this number associated with this color. And I tried that for a month, like every day I would sort of stare at a, a group of numbers on my wall and it was kind of bizarre to walk by uh, my office at any given time and just be standing there kind of looking at my wall. And I stood there for about 15 minutes every day to about half an hour every day. And I did this every day for about um, three weeks. And at the end of it, I um, actually didn't find that there was any kind of synesthesia that I could detect, except for one thing. As I was walking by uh, New College on my way to class, one day I kind of looked at the um, poster that was there and I realized that this poster that was in red actually had uh, the number 2016. And I thought, that's actually the wrong color for that number one to be associated with it, or for the number two associated with it. And, and this was one of those things that I realized that it may be possible that if you were given, if you were given enough time and you really had enough resources to try it, then maybe, in fact, there are possibilities for creating new pathways or new strengthened con uh, connections between different areas uh, of your brain. Uh, maybe at some point down the road, if I have time, maybe I'll go back and give that um, uh, sort of experiment another shot. So let me tell you about a typical type of LTP experiment that you need to know some of the details uh, about. This is a fundamental thing. Like if you are a true neuroscientist, at some point in your career, it doesn't matter what you end up doing, whether it's behavioral studies, whether you're going to neural imaging. At some point in your career, you're going to be looking at hippocampal neurons. And one of the things that is really incredibly important is that this model system is one that is ingrained within the psyche of neuroscience. This is like what neuroscience fundamentally comes down to. This idea of homosynaptic plasticity, or plasticity of a single synapse, involves stimulating those Schaffer collaterals. Remember the Schaffer collaterals branch off from the CA3 neurons, and they continue on. There's another branch that forms the commissural pathway of the CA3 neurons. And these um, Schaffer collaterals are ones that we can actually put an electrode in. And I'm gonna show you that in the next diagram. At the same time, as we stimulate these Schaffer collaterals, we can also stick another electrode onto its normally synapsing cell, which is known as the CA1. So that goes back to understanding that circuit that I showed you um, earlier on. And we can record what is known as the postsynaptic potential. And we can record what happens when I stimulate the Schaffer collaterals, what happens to this neuron that I'm recording this PSP from. So normally, we don't really worry too much about that. However, I told you that LTP, or the strengthening of the synapse, is use or activity dependent. The more I use this pathway, the more neurotransmitters I release from the synapse, the stronger the synapse will get. And in order for us to do this experimentally, one of the things that we would do would be to stimulate that neuron. Again, this is the Schaffer collateral. And this recording paradigm in the old days used to involve um, having 100 hertz or tetanic stimulation, and we would stimulate 100 action potentials for one second. Sometimes we would do 100 action potentials for one hertz for two seconds. Uh, so we'd have 200 action potentials in total that we would be able to deliver through this um, stimulating electrode. Then we'd wait a while. We'd wait about three or four minutes to let the neurons recover. And then we would go in and we would measure the postsynaptic response from neuron P. We would still release the same amount of glutamate when we did a test pulse, so what we had before and what we did after LTP, or after doing the 100 
Kurtz stimulation, we would go back in and then we would see what the postsynaptic potential did. Did it get stronger? Did it get bigger? Or did it stay exactly the same as it was before we did this 100 hertz? Generally, if you do this experiment and it's done well, one of the things that happens is that the postsynaptic potential that we are measuring from, and this is from that secondary neuron, neuron B, the CA1 neuron in other words, this can actually be augmented for several days. If we had the recording equipment to be able to do this, you could actually record this for up to several months. There are very few labs that can actually keep a slice of tissue in and out of the brain alive for more than one or two days, but some labs have actually worked out how to keep these slices alive for um, up to uh, about a month or so. So when they do that, they can actually see that this is a really long-lasting form of um, LTP, or strengthening. Again, this is sort of the fundamental basis for what I'm going to be showing you in the, in the next um, diagrams. So again, this shows you the same sort of architecture. This is where I need you to make sure, because I'm guaranteeing you and I'm telling you this in advance, that you will have questions, both short answer questions as well as multiple choice test questions, related to understanding this circuit, which is fundamental to neuroscience. All neuroscience is based on circuits now. It doesn't matter if you're looking at neuroimaging or if you are looking at behavior. All neuroscience is related to breaking things down into circuits. And so you need to know what the perforant pathway is. You need to know what cells that they are making synapses onto. And in particular, you need to know this pathway that I just outlined for you, which is where we are stimulating this group of axons that are denoted as the Schaffer collaterals. And we are at the same time recording from these CA1 neurons that we see here. We can see all of these under a fairly low power microscope. It's not quite visible with the naked eye, but even with a good magnifying glass, you are able to see the cell bodies as well as these axon fibers. And so it's fairly easy to be able to do these types of experiments. So typically we take these brain slices and we will use these electrophysiological um, techniques. And most of these models tend to use what um, still is referred to as titanic stimulation. This is very high frequency. This electrode here, in other words, at the end of it, it will create an electric field at the very end or the tip of the electrode. And we create enough of an electric field that the axons that are nearby will actually fire action potential 100 times each second. And that is 100 hertz. Um, and we can do this for a few seconds, we can do this for one second, it really depends on what we are hoping to do. And then we wait a while and then we go back and record from the CA1 neuron. Because this is now thought to be fairly um, non-physiological, we very, very rarely see long bursts of 100 um, hertz per second, uh, but we do detect within the brain of um, animals that are moving around and learning uh, bursts which are called theta bursts. This is related to the frequency. The, these theta burst patterns have been found, and these theta bursts can actually be mimicked by having very, very short 100 hertz um, stimuli. So we don't do 100 hertz for um, one full second, but we might have 100 action potential, uh, 100 action potentials that are delivered over 250 milliseconds, or a very short uh, duration. So by doing this, having these very short bursts, this mimics um, what happens in the brain when you're trying to learn something. As you're trying to strain and figure out, like, what is he saying? What, what is this diagram actually showing? If I were to measure this, either electrophysiologically, or I had a very, very sophisticated silicon electrode that I was able to implant near your hippocampus, I would actually see theta burst activity, little bursts of action potentials that are in the range of about 100 hertz over 250 milliseconds. And this is what we think is much more physiological now. I'd like to make sure that you know for the final exam what um, titanic stimulation is, as well as theta burst stimulation. And for the, for the sake of the final exam, um, I don't need you to worry too much about this. Some of you will take other uh, courses related to neuroscience, and you'll learn about spike timing, dependent plasticity. But for your final exam in this course, we are, we're not going to uh, be covering this, so you don't have to worry about this third bullet point. But I do need you to know the architecture. I do need you to know how we record and the types of stimuli that we will put into this electrode to be able to cause a change here. If everything works, 
This is what the response would have looked at looked like beforehand, and this is what we would see after 100 hertz stimulation. That same cell is now giving us, for the same type of uh, test pulse, is giving us a much more enhanced response. This will last for a week, this will last for a month, if we are able to keep the slice alive, and this is what we talk about as LTP. This CA1 neuron, in other words, now, is much stronger and more responsive than it was before that high frequency stimulation um, had existed. So I also wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up related to some of the different terminology that is associated with LTP and to make sure that we're all on the same page related to um, the different phases of LTP. So the, if we were to take a look, this is sort of diagrammatically one of the things that we would um, typically do. We would be recording from that CA1 neuron and we get a certain size response and we would normalize it to 100%. And we would continue to do this for about uh, 10 minutes on this particular graph. So we measure like every um, 30 seconds or so, we measure like how much is this CA1 neuron that we're recording from, how much is it responding. And we see that over time, there's really no change. It stays about the same when we go back and test it. Then we do that high frequency tetanic stimulation. And this is that tetanic stimulation that we talk about. When we do this tetanic stimulation, we say that we are inducing LTP, or this synapse is undergoing induction. And this induction process occurs where we get a strengthening of the synapse that we call expression. So we induce it, we try to uh, have a type of stimulation where we will produce a long-lasting response, and this induction, we can go back and test to see if it actually has occurred <coughs> by looking at whether or not we get an increase, and this expression is something that we see early on. And eventually this always comes down. And again, we won't go into the mechanisms for why the expression phase comes down to this level, but we will see that it does indeed stay above what it was before, uh, high frequency stimulation. And we say that this is the maintenance phase of LTP. Now why is all of that important? Why do I have to bother? As long as it's getting stronger, does it really matter if I'm talking about the maintenance phase versus the expression phase versus the induction phase, etc. It actually does matter because what is happening at each of these different phases, whether we're looking at expression versus maintenance, involve different proteins. The proteins that are involved in expression are different than the proteins that are involved in maintenance. And that's one of the reasons why we have to know and be able to parse out these different um, elements of what we call LTP. So again, most of you will have seen very, very similar diagrams before. And I'm going to tell you in advance that the expression of LTP, that induction phase to produce LTP, or to make sure that we get strengthening, we require this molecule here known as the NMDA receptor. We need this for the induction, we need this for the initial expression, but we don't need NMDA receptors for the maintenance. That is a different molecule. And that's why we need to know what we're talking about for LTP. In fact, this is LTP. Expression is LTP. The induction produces LTP. And maintenance shows LTP. But when we're talking about the expression versus maintenance versus induction, the molecules that are involved are different. So NMDA receptors that are responsive to glutamate that at rest are normally blocked by magnesium, they are what is required for the expression as well as the induction of LTP. And that's important, and that's something that I'd like you to make sure that you know. And one of the reasons why we think that this is important is that normally at rest, these, these um, NMDA receptors um, are uh, blocked by this mo molecule known as magnesium. And we don't really think about this in a traditional sense um, because we don't really talk about it. But in fact, your synapses are not these nice clean pictures that we see here. We know that there are a number of extracellular molecules, so we don't put things up here like lysine. There's all sorts of lysine that's involved in activating NMDA receptors. Different ions that exist, like magnesium, are always um, involved in these processes as well. And so this magnesium ion is normally blocking the NMDA receptor at rest, and then following high-frequency uh, tetanic stimulation, 
the depolarization that's induced will actually remove this magnesium and allow calcium and sodium to flow in through the NMDA receptor. And this influx of sodium and calcium is what accounts for this large um, induction as well as the expression of NMDA. Uh, sorry, the expression of um, LTP. And it's all mediated through this molecule here known as the NMDA receptor. So these NMDA receptors are incredibly important in the induction as well as the early expression of LTP. And we know this because if we have specific inhibitors, which again, you should make sure that you know for question two on the online quiz, and we're going to try this in a few moments, the pharmacological inhibition of um, NMDA receptors, we can use different um, types of drugs. So when we get a slice and we do all of these stimulations, in that bath uh, around the slice, we can uh, include different chemicals like MK801, which is a chemical like, uh, that I'd like you to highlight, as well as a chemical known as AP5, also called APV. Uh, and these two chemicals, MK801 and APV or AP5, block and specifically block NMDA receptors. They don't do anything else to any other part of the nervous system except to block NMDA receptors. So if you're blocking NMDA receptors, which I just told you were so important, and we were to then do high frequency stimulation, and this black bar shows you that um, the MK801 or AP5 or APV is present during this induction phase here, when we go back and we look at the CA1 neuron, we, do, we don't see strengthening. So we don't see expression, there is no induction. Because NMDA receptors are blocked, there is no effect. Now I also told you that NMDA receptors are not important after induction. So if we did the same experiment again, we had this baseline, they're all at 100%. We measure it for about 10 minutes. Then we do this high frequency stimulation that you see here. Then we wait a few minutes and then we see the response. We get that induction causing expression and then we see it coming back down. If we were then to apply MK801 or AP5 here and NMDA receptors were still important for this strengthening, so it's still above this baseline. If we were then to look at the effect here, we should, in theory, see a reduction, but we do not. Because at this stage, NMDA receptors are no longer responsible for the maintenance of LTP. It's done its job, it's initiated the signal, but now using these pharmacological inhibitors, we know that NMDA receptors are not the molecules that are involved in this process. Okay, and this is the way that we normally try to understand the molecular processes that are involved. And this again, these different molecules, these different proteins, uh, and different uh, pharmacological agents are ones that I'd like you to make sure that you know for question two, as well as this molecule down here, uh, known as CAM kinase 2. And I'm going to spend some time in the next uh, 10 minutes or so talking to you about um, CAM kinase 2. So these are the molecular steps that were involved in that induction as well as expression. Some kind of stimulation, whether it's high frequency tetanic stimulation or theta burst stimulation, has presynaptically released glutamate. Because remember, our, record, our stimulating electrode is found on the Schaffer collaterals, which are the presynaptic elements. This causes the release of massive amounts of glutamate, which will then bind to the postsynaptic receptors on the cell that we are recording from on CA1. So on the CA1 neuron that we're recording from, we have both AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors. That glutamate will bind to both AMPA as well as to NMDA. However, glutamate binding to AMPA will allow um, sodium to flow in because glutamate is um, not um, being blocked through magnesium. But NMDA receptors cannot bind and open uh, because they are being blocked by magnesium at rest. After this depolarization has continued through the AMPA receptors though, so we get sodium influx, eventually that depolarization through the um, AMPA receptors will cause the NMDA receptors to open and allow calcium to flow through. This is the key effect that we want to see in the induction as well as the in expression. Because what happens next is important for the maintenance phase. Now that we have calcium flowing through, that's it. Uh, NMDA receptors are no longer required. That calcium is enough to activate um, calcium um, calmodulin-dependent CAM kinase 2, 
uh, as well as um, other proteins like protein kinase C. I'm not going to concentrate on PKC, nor do you have to know this for the final exam. I'm going to be concentrating on CAM kinase 2 and its role um, in uh, the maintenance phase of LTP. So if we were uh, to go through, and again, this is related to question two, and we were to look at um, the role of CAM kinase 2, most of this work actually was verified and validated in the early uh, 1990s. And it was primarily the work of this individual here known as Alcino Silva, who is a, a massive researcher down um, in uh, Canada, UCLA. And in fact, he has several ties here to uh, U of T. Do any of you know uh, his progeny here at U of T? Not that he has children here, but he has um, children through his research. Do any of you know Paul Franklin? or Sheena Jocelyn. So they, they are the direct sort of progeny of Alcino Silva where they worked in his lab. And so many of the ideas that came out um, are actually from Alcino Silva's uh, lab. And one of the things that he proved quite convincingly, and this has withstood the, the test of time, is that CAM kinase 2 was a molecule that people thought might be really important. And CAM kinase 2, one isoform of this, CAM kinase 2 alpha, is very, very heavily expressed within the hippocampus. So it was a potential candidate for um, the signaling molecule that's involved in uh, the maintenance of LTP. It's very heavily found in postsynaptic neurons. It's really important within the hippocampus. And people had done some biochemical studies to actually show that um, this was autophosphorylated um, by itself once calcium entered into those neurons. So again, great idea, great story. Is this the potential molecule that maintains LTP after NMDA receptor no longer is required? This autophosphorylation was something that people really couldn't get their handle on. So again, in the uh, early 2000s, late 1990s, um, Alcino Silva's group actually published a series of papers convincingly showing that because of the overall structure of CAM kinase 2 alpha, one of the things that is really important is the autophosphorylation, its ability to phosphorylate itself. So once calcium comes in and calcium binds to calmodulin, the complex moves over to uh, CAM kinase 2 alpha, activates CAM kinase 2 alpha, then CAM kinase 2 alpha, once it gets activated, starts turning itself on by autophosphorylating itself. That autophosphorylation was found to be key. If you don't have that autophosphorylation, you don't get as strong an LTP, you don't get a strong downstream effect. And one of the reasons they knew that this was important, and Alcino Silva's group knew that this was important, they had developed a mutant where the threonine that was important for autophosphorylation, this is the site that gets phosphorylated, if you mutated the threonine, to an alanine. So alanines cannot have a phosphate group added. Threonines can have a phosphate group added. If you did that, and you had everything else in the kinase the same, what would be the consequence? Would LTP be affected? And it turns out that yes, without this autophosphorylation on this residue of this threonine, that LTP is affected, learning is affected, memory is affected in these mice because of this CAM kinase 2 molecule. And as a result of this transgenic mouse that was developed, this autophosphorylation um, event and CAM kinase 2 in general is now almost universally thought to be the molecule that's involved in the maintenance. And it fits the story incredibly well. We need NMDA early. NMDA causes the influx of calcium. And calcium is then required to activate and turn on this autophosphorylation process within uh, the um, postsynaptic neurons. So if you were trying to block the maintenance phase of LTP after using high-frequency stimulation, uh, which one of the following of these uh, different possibilities would actually allow you to block the maintenance phase after high-frequency stimulation? So if you were looking at the early events, you were probably looking at an NMDA receptor blocker. So it could be uh, APD. That's the induction and expression, but if you're talking about the maintenance, you're probably looking at things that will affect CAM kinase 2. So I'm very happy to see that um, almost all of you have picked the correct answer here, which is a CAM kinase 2 um, inhibitor. 
Do you have any questions on this before we go on? I know I've just gone through a, a number of different um, steps and a number of different concepts. Any questions? No? Okay. So I don't really need you to memorize this slide. Uh, we actually have known a great deal more about amponase 2. Amponase 2 alpha is the isoform that we're particularly interested in. Um, Camp kinase 2 beta is um, more uh, localized to the dendrites. It's less likely to be found in the cell bodies. You don't need to worry about those details. It's just to give you an idea that this is the domain that is being uh, mutated, and this is the regulatory domain that we are interested in. This is the domain that also binds to calmodulin. You don't have to memorize anything at all from this slide, and I promise you there will be nothing from this slide on your final exam. It's just to give you some context as to why that experiment was so important. That was done before the structure of um, campanase 2 was found. This was done much, much later. And Alcino Silva's um, data has withstood um, well over uh, 20 years' worth of scrutiny. So it's an amazing piece of work if you think about it. So this is more of the proof that he had from his paper. And I need to go through some of this data with you. And some of this data now should be a little bit more clear to you. Uh, just again, out of curiosity, th these are two different groups of mice that he, are look at, that he is looking at. In the black squares here at the bottom, he is looking at mice and the hippocampal slices from mice that have a mutation in the threonine 286 position. So these are the 286A mice, and you can see that their LTP is dramatically affected. So we, they don't get a lot of LTP, in other words. So... Can you tell me how many action potentials per second is he um, stimulating the Schaffer collaterals with here at one hertz? Can I hear a one? Okay, thank you. So we have like one action potential per second. We don't get any strengthening. Um, and then we have two action potentials per second. We get uh, 10... 10 action potentials per second. This is titanic stimulation of 100 action potentials per second. And the amount of LTP is actually very, very strongly reduced. It's not very high when we're using these um, mutant uh, transgenic mice. If we were to compare this to a, um, a wild-type mouse that has the normal threonine at position 286 that can autophosphorylate itself, and we increase the amount of uh, stimulation, 2 hertz stimulation, 10 hertz, and 100 hertz, we will see the types of LTP that we saw previously, all suggesting that um, from Alcino Silva's group that that autophosphorylation and CAM kinase 2 are incredibly important in the generation of LTP. Can you tell me why they did this experiment and what this experiment over here with AP5 is showing? What did they do there? You should be able to predict or make the intuitive guess as to why they have AP5 uh, here in this particular figure. So what is AP5 doing? So these are blocking the NMDA receptors. And so when you were trying to induce and cause expression of LTP, even if you are looking at the wild type in the open circles or you're doing this in the mutant mice, you are not able to produce LTP. So it is still an NMDA receptor dependent um, process that they're trying to show. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through this in great detail right now. Uh, I will go come back to explain this a little bit later on. But if we were to look at um, how quickly an animal learns, the quicker it learns, the, the quicker uh, the time course of this goes down. And the wild-type animals learn fairly quickly. So the number of trials, the number of times they have to learn how to escape um, onto a platform in a water maze, for example, the, as they learn it more and more frequently, as more LTP builds up, as the same pathways get used over and over again, as we get more and more autophosphorylation, we find that it takes um, shorter and shorter times for that animal to learn how to escape this particular Morris water maze. It takes a lot longer for an animal that has impaired LTP to be able to find a platform to be able to escape to, which is showing that not only is LTP affected, but, L but the learning uh, is also affected in these animals. They can't find that platform as quickly, even if they've run the same trials 
over and over again, it still takes them an awfully long time for them to be able to escape uh, this Morris water main that I'll be talking to you about very briefly. Do you have any questions on this before we go on? Or anything that's not so clear for you? Okay, so again, other people have gone on to show in other ways that CAM kinase 2 is incredibly important. These are much more sophisticated techniques that allow us to have precision guided um, ways to activate CAM kinase 2, not just in neurons, but in specific spines of neurons. And this would represent a dendrite, and this would represent a spine. And at the ends of these spines, we would have these different. AMPA and NMDA receptors. And one of the things that you can do is you can find one of these spines and you can stimulate this spine and you can observe what happens when you stimulate this particular spine. Now, one of the other things that I'm going to tell you is that this spine also contains CAM kinase 2. So if I stimulate it with light, that CAM kinase 2 now becomes activated. It gets autophosphorylated. And just by doing that, by stimulating it with light and getting this little dot being stimulated, we can actually show a strengthening of the response at this spine. So this, again, confirms that CAM kinase 2 is incredibly important and vital in the strengthening and LTP process that we've been looking at. And again, you can actually watch um, CAM kinase 2 move to spines and make spines bigger as LTP processes occur. And all of these suggest that CAM kinase 2, since the initial publications in 1997, 1998, 2001, and 2002, all reveal that Alcino Silva's group were correct. They made the right guess that CAM kinase 2 alpha is indeed the molecule that's responsible for the uh, maintenance, and, uh, maintenance, maintenance of LTP within the hippocampus. So there's one other thing that I'm going to um, mention to you, and this diagram kind of shows you schematically more or less the same thing. But I, but I also want you to think about this because this has been um, fairly controversial. So this is the normal response that we get of the AMPA receptor. And after LTP, of course, the response gets much bigger. We already have demonstrated this and have already shown this. Interestingly, I also told you at this synapse, we also have the NMDA receptor. Now, you might be wondering, okay, the AMPA receptor, the response going up, you've shown me that before, now you're telling me that response getting bigger after LTP is mainly due to AMPA receptors. That has also been shown to have withstood the test of time. It's also around the early 2000s that this was first um, uncovered. But it's a very funny um, uh, sort of conundrum that this receptor that's also found in the exact same synapse, responding to the exact same neurotransmitter glutamate, after LTP, the NMDA receptor response before LTP and after LTP does it change. Based on this graph that I've shown you here at the bottom, is it getting any bigger or smaller? Same, exactly the same. We don't understand that because they're not really all that different. We don't know why AMPA receptors seem to be very mobile, they can move in and out of the synapse, whereas NMDA receptors that look almost identical are actually stuck within the synapse. And one day, one of you who are sitting in this room are going to take up that challenge to figure out why are the NMDA receptors that look almost identical in many ways to um, AMPA receptors, why don't they move in the same way that AMPA receptors do in this particular diagram? Because we think now that NMDA receptors, when activated, allow the influx of calcium, which will then activate this kinase, CAM kinase 2. And CAM kinase 2 may phosphorylate AMPA receptors, causing them to stay open longer, causing this increase. Or it may simply cause more AMPA receptors to traffic to the surface and therefore have more AMPA receptors available on the cell surface. But why doesn't NMDA receptors, why don't they do the same thing? Still a mystery even after um, about 20 years. So I think now is probably a good time before we get into some of the mechanisms of receptor trafficking uh, to uh, take a little bit of a, a break. So um, I'm going to ask for a little bit of help. We're going to do um, sort of a mindfulness exercise. I know some of you are feeling a little bit anxious, so you can also stay seated. It won't take very long to uh, get through this, but if you can all do that, that would be great um, as well. And it will only take a few minutes to go through this exercise.